welcome to the Broadway.com show, filmed right here in New York's theater district. I'm Ryan Lee Gilbert. And I'm Paul Wontorek. This week, we chat with Adina Menzel about her New York stage return, catch up with Mean Girls Tony nominee Ashley Park, and more. And later, Tony nominee Jamie Parker tells us about making magic in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. But first, let's get started with the news. What's the buzz, Paul? There's a new handsome man in the upcoming Broadway musical, Pretty Woman. Three-time Tony Award nominee and Olivier Award winner, Andy Carl has taken over the role of Edward Lewis from Tony winner Steve Kazee, who played the part during the show's out-of-town run at Chicago's Oriental Theater. According to a statement, Kazee has left the musical, based on the hit 1990 film, for family reasons. Carl is, of course, known for a trio of Tony-nominated performances in Rocky, On the 20th Century, and Groundhog Day, and has also appeared in shows like Wicked, Jersey Boys, and Legally Blonde. In that one, he starred as Kyle, the UPS guy who romances beautician Paulette, played by Carl's real-life wife, Orfe. A Tony nominee herself for that show, Orfe is conveniently now one of the stars of Pretty Woman, alongside Les Mis film standout Samantha Barks as Vivian, Eric Anderson, Jason Danieli, and Kingsley Legs. With Tony winner Jerry Mitchell as director and choreographer, Pretty Woman starts at the Nederlander Theater on Broadway on July 20th, with opening night set for August 16th. Andy and Orfe, together at last. They aren't a couple in this one, but they've been married for so long and you gotta keep it interesting. The film rights for Lin-Manuel Miranda and Chiara Alegria Hudes in the Heights have officially landed at Warner Brothers Entertainment. The $50 million deal follows a studio bidding war that unfolded after the two creators called for the troubled Weinstein company to release the rights to the property in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal. The rights reverted back to Miranda and Hudes earlier this year after Hudes publicly requested that Weinstein drop the rights as the sexual assault and harassment allegations against the producer surfaced and escalated. John M. Chu was attached to direct the screen adaptation of the musical, which opened on Broadway in 2008 and went on to win four Tony Awards, including Best Musical and Best Original Score. No word yet on a production timeline for the In the Heights film, but hopefully it won't be long now. Clever. I assume lin Mama Miranda will be in it. Uh, they better make it sooner. He'll be pushing the piragua cart. <laughs> Here's the latest on awards season. Three Tall Women star Glenda Jackson was named the winner of Drama League's Distinguished Performance Award at the 84th Annual Awards Ceremony on May 18th. With top show prizes awarded to Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, The Band's Visit, Angels in America, and My Fair Lady. The Cheetah Rivera Awards, which shines a well-deserved spotlight on Broadway dancers, were presented on May 20th with Tony Gazbeck of Prince of Broadway and Ariana DeBose of Summer, the Donna Summer Musical, named Top Hoofers. Summer's Sergio Trujillo won for Outstanding Choreography on Broadway, while the cast of Carousel and Mean Girls tied as Outstanding Ensemble. Finally, the 63rd Annual Obie Awards toasted the top off-Broadway writing, directing, acting, and design talents on May 21st. Among this year's winners were familiar Broadway stars like Will Swenson for Jerry Springer the Opera, Billy Crudup for Harry Clark, Carrie Coon for Mary Jane, and Angels in America Tony nominee Denise Goff for her acclaimed turn in the play People, Places, and Things. Congrats to all. Original cast member Merle Dandridge will return to the role of Papa Gay in the Tony-nominated revival of Once on This Island, beginning June 18th at the Circle in the Square Theater. Dandridge will return for a limited engagement through August 19th, while current cast member Tamira Gray, who succeeded Dandridge in the role back in January when she left to film the third season of the TV series Greenleaf, will return as the show's Demon of Death on August 20th. And Sky Lakota Lynch will make his Broadway debut as Jared Kleinman in the Tony-winning Dear Evan Hansen, beginning June 12th at the Music Box Theater. Lakota Lynch will succeed original cast member Will Rowland, who will play his final performance on June 10th. Rowland is departing the company to star in Joe Iconis' coming-of-age musical Be More Chill, which begins off-Broadway performances on July 26th. Merrily we roll along, that musical Heartbreaker by Stephen Sondheim and George Firth is heading back to the New York stage. Roundabout Theatre Company will produce a reimagined staging by Fiasco Theatre Off-Broadway in 2019. Fiasco car artistic director Noah Brody will direct and Lauren Lataro will choreograph with music direction and orchestrations by Carousel star Alexander Gemignani, son of original Merrily music director Paul Gemignani. The musical, which played a famously brief run of 16 performances when it debuted in 1981, is well loved by theater fans and tells the story of three friends over many years, but told backwards in time. Fiasco previously produced a brilliant staging of Sondheim's Into the Woods for Roundabout, so expectations here at the Broadway.com show are high for this one. Performances start January 12, 2019, and we are so there. 
The signature theater revival of Stephen Adley Gerges' Our Lady of 121st Street, which opened off-Broadway on May 20th, has been extended an additional week and will now continue through June 17th. The play, which follows signature's Lucille Lortel award-winning staging of Gerges' Jesus Hop to the A-Train, is directed by Felicia Rashad. Meanwhile, the off-Broadway premiere of Dominique Morisot's Paradise Blue has also been extended and will now continue through June 17th as well at Signature's Romulus Linney Courtyard Theater. Directed by Ruben Santiago Hudson and starring Dear Evan Hansen standout Crystal and Lloyd, the drama takes place in a jazz club in Detroit's gentrifying Black Bottom neighborhood in 1949. And the immersive off-Broadway staging of Sweeney Todd will end its record-breaking run at the Barrow Street Theater on August 26th. The production, which arrived in New York City following sold-out runs in London, where the show debuted in an actual pie shop, began previews in February 2017 and is the longest-running musical ever to play the downtown theater. When we come back, we sit down with the band's visit director, David Cromer, get to know the Iceman Cometh's David Morse and Austin Butler, and more. This week on Broadway.com, My Fair Lady's Lauren Ambrose talks about throwing her hat into the ring for the loverly role. Carousel Fresh Face Brittany Pollock shows off her fancy footwork and more. Travesties is the most celebrated comedy of the season. The New York Times calls it a ridiculously entertaining joyride with four Tony nominations, including Best Play Revival. It's possibly the only perfect production on Broadway. Travesties through June 17th only. Hi, I'm Katrina Link, and you're watching the Broadway.com show. Welcome back. Ashley Park is having a major moment. After performances in the King and I and Sunday in the Park with George, she's become an award season darling this year, winning a Lucille Lortel Award for Off-Broadway's K-Pop and earning her first Tony Award nomination for her hilarious turn as Gretchen Wieners in Mean Girls. We talked to Park about why she's thrilled to get a chance to revisit high school every night in the musical comedy hit. Every day I'm so excited to be doing the show that I'm doing with the people that I'm doing it with. And so like I'm feeling like very overwhelmed by gratitude every day. Very happy to be in the present moment right now. Casey Nicola and Tina Fey and our entire team really had to take a chance on me because I hadn't done a lot of contemporary shows in the New York theater and I hadn't ever really done a comedy in, in this kind of big scale. And so having me in the room and having them really be like, her, she's fetch. Playing one of the popular plastics in Mean Girls is a jarringly different high school experience than Park's own, when she was sidelined after being diagnosed with leukemia. A lot of people ask us, oh, like what table did you sit at when you were in high school? I kind of veer away from answering it sometimes because a big part of my high school was not being in school and was being treated. I had six rounds of chemo and I was in a hospital for most of my sophomore year of high school. And so my experience with cancer is one of the reasons why I'm doing theater in the first place is because as soon as I was out of the hospital, all I wanted to do was be around people. I just loved that theater was you're always with, the, you're always creating with other people, you're always performing for other people. And it was just like the happiest that I was. Although she loves her current Broadway turn, Park is also excited to see where her career takes her next. I have um, aspirations, as we all do. But I think the coolest part about this business is I think I'm just, I'm really open to whatever comes next. Especially this time right now and this season and with this past year, everything that has come my way, I really didn't expect. I'm just really excited for whatever. It feels very much bigger than me at this point. And I also think I want a puppy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you can catch Ashley Park in Mean Girls at the August Wilson Theatre. Skin Tight is the latest from playwright Joshua Harmon, who previously showed theater audiences a good time with his truthful, funny plays, Bad Jews, and Significant Other. In the Roundabout Theater Company off-Broadway production, Tony Award winner Adina Menzel returns to the stage to play Jody, a 40-something woman at a crossroads. We found out more from Menzel and her co-stars at a recent meet and greet. Her husband has left her for a significantly younger woman. She's feeling really lonely and rejected, and so she wants to try to go home and get some TLC from some family and reconnect with her dad. He is a very successful, I would say, like fashion mogul. He's built an incredible empire from the ground up, and it's his 70th birthday. She meets her father's significantly younger boyfriend, and she's then sort of confronted with all of the crap. Medina's character is not expecting to see me at this house. She does. 
and I'm not expecting to see her. And we're both sort of just trying to figure each other out. She has a 20-year-old gay son who kind of comes along with her, and it's just about the family dynamic and how they deal with it all. And, you know, it really, at the core, is about a family. Although it definitely lives up to its sexy title, the company says Joshua Harmon's play also has a lot to say about the world we live in. The text is so amazing. It's provocative. It's sexy. There are definitely sexy moments. Um, there's kind of, you get a little bit of everything. You can see a lot of skin. You <laughs> see some of mine. Yeah, <laughs> some of mine. It's an, it's an explosive uh, family drama that touches on so many subjects that are so central to our culture, class and privilege and age and beauty. Sex and youth and wealth and um, identity. Marriage, life, death, children. It's people being extremely um, heart-wrenchingly honest, so sometimes that's very funny. <laughs> Skin Tight offers the opportunity for Adina Menzel, while well loved for her musical performances in Rent, Wicked, and If Then, to return to the New York stage in a play. We did a workshop together a couple of years ago uh, with an earlier draft of the script, and she was incandescent from the get-go, and it was like, we would be so lucky, and we are. I have to say, like, I was so nervous, because it's Elphaba, like, I was, you know, the, the theater kid inside me. Now I just pinch myself on a daily basis that I get to sit back and watch her, like, work. She's a force of nature, but she's also, she's a great, great straight play actor as well, and it's just such a joy to, uh, to play off of her, and I feel a lot of genuine affection, so that works well for a mother-son relationship. It's nice to be back in New York City, it is, and it, it, not, it doesn't get old seeing your face on a big poster, and you know, in a new play, and it's, it's exciting. Skin Tight starts performances May 31st at Off-Broadway's Laura Pell's Theatre. David Cromer is an acclaimed director who has received many accolades in his career, including an Hotel Award, an Obie Award, and a MacArthur Genius Grant. Now his direction of the band's visit has earned him a Tony nomination. Take a look as Cromer talks about the challenges and joys of working on this atypical Broadway musical, which has garnered 11 Tony Award nominations. The show has a really gentle tone. The film does, the score does, Edomar's writing is. I think the world of these characters really does. And the world of the, the, the story has, has created has a very gentle, quiet quality to it. There's all kinds of, of, of musicals, and there's all kinds of ways to tell stories, and so we just kind of took a gamble that we could do something that might seem initially counterintuitive. We were just trying to keep it full, keep it specific, keep it readable, uh, keep it interesting, uh, while not necessarily trying to hurl it to the back of the house, that we could allow the back of the house full access from where they were straight down to it. Let me tell you about We were always embracing the film and never wanted to run away from the film. The film has the benefit of being shot in the desert, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then all these vast vistas. Well, we can't really quite put that on stage, so how would we translate those things into that feeling? Not copy those things, but try to find that feeling. We figured that had to be in the movement, uh, that had to be in um, texture really. One of the first things Scott Pask said is he wanted the walls of the, the buildings we were going to put on stage to have an enormous amount of texture. Scott Pask is the set designer. An enormous amount of texture and one of the so that you, people could see time and history even though they were going to be sort of the poured concrete walls of this you know this sort of shanty town. Even with all of his accolades, Cromer found he had a surprising response to his Tony nomination. It makes me giddy um, it is a kind of uh, giddiness that I uh, did not uh, particularly, uh, was not aware was still in me. <laughs> um, to be in any way a part of the cultural history of Broadway. Whatever, even if it's just a footnote, it's on the list. When they go through the plays, what, what did they do in, in 2018? It will be there. The band's visit is a simple story about a group of Egyptian musicians stranded in the wrong Israeli town for a night. 
Cromer explains why it moves audiences so profoundly. It is about the beat of your heart uh, because it is about the, um, the motor that is always going even when you think you are in stasis and it is about hard-earned hope. a band's visit at the Ethel Barrymore Theatre. Denzel Washington may be the headliner on the marquee, but the Tony-nominated revival of Eugene O'Neill's The Iceman Cometh is chock full of fantastic performers. Today, we'll meet two, 2018 Tony nominee David Morse and rising star Austin Butler. Yeah, we, we didn't meet until our first rehearsal day. We had a little rehearsal with just the two of us and George um, before we started official rehearsals. He was remarkable for he was so prepared for this role. Um, and, and I really think because it was your, you know, you were new to the experience and you knew the actors you're gonna be there with, you, you really wanted to be on your game. And it came, he had the, was prepared in the clothes, something like period clothes, period underwear for crying out loud, your long underwear, whatever it was, and then his, his watch fob. And I mean, he was there all ready to go. I knew the, the, the people that I was going to be on stage with and in that rehearsal room and I think just the, the, the Everest of terror that I was feeling um, mm. and just this, this, also just this responsibility that I felt of bringing Eugene O'Neill's words to life um, that that was, I, I just, I wanted to do the absolute best that I could. In the play, the two stars act out the dark father and son dynamic of the characters of Larry and Don, the grown son of Larry's ex-girlfriend. Their mutual admiration offstage helped forge their onstage bond. I've respected his work for years. I mean, since I was a kid, I've been watching him, so it, it's been a really amazing thing to now have so much time together and, and, um, and to just, just learn from masters, you know, that's, that's an amazing thing. It also helps that he, he has such a great heart. You know, he brings that heart to this every time he rehearses or we, we're in that room or on that stage. And you can see it, you can feel it, you know, what he's, what he's doing. So it, it's, it's helpful for me, you know, to have that kind of life to work with all the time. A first-time Tony nominee for The Iceman Cometh, Morse says performing in the classic play reminds him of the one-of-a-kind experience of doing live theater. You know, there is, there is something that happens in theater, whether it's on Broadway or not, that I think is beyond, sometimes it can happen in film and television, but not really the way it happens on a stage. A life that happens and a spirit that happens, it comes together with an audience. They become a part of it. You know, they're, they're you know, when we're, we're all there together, going through this together. And when you're working with the right kind of people, you know, it's almost a spiritual kind of experience. It just elevates, everybody elevates. And in this production, I think that that really happens. Last night, I heard this woman sobbing during Hickey's speech at the end. And something in that just struck something in me where I, it was this like extremely grounding feeling of, this is, yes, we're playing pretend, but it's also real. Yeah, the experience is real. It's, an ex it's you, you real. Can't, you can't say it's not real. What well, we're experiencing is real in, yeah. in, in that theater. And, and, and it's just such a beautiful, yeah trippy experience mm. and when when it all kind of comes together in that way it's been just really a fascinating experience for them. Butler and Moore say they'd love to perform together again perhaps in something a bit lighter than O'Neill. Let's just do everything together. I told him early on I said our, our next play let's let's do something where we're having a delightful conversation on a park <laughs> bench and he said there are no plays about that. <laughs> <laughs> no plays we want to do anyway. No plays we want to do yeah. Witness David Morse and Austin Butler's fantastic performances in The Iceman Cometh, playing at the Bernard B. Jacobs Theatre through July 1st. When we return, Tony nominee Jamie Parker, who plays Harry Potter in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, talks magic, trauma, and Quidditch. It'll take brains. It'll take courage. It'll take heart to prove I'm not. Wicked. Welcome back. I'm here with Jamie Parker, Olivier Award winner for playing Harry Potter in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Well, first of all, congratulations for being a Tony nominee. And we just found out that Harry Potter has won the Broadway.com Audience Choice Award for Favorite New Play. Brilliant. 
So how's Great award news. season treating oh, you? Amazing. We're just bouncing from one thing to the next at the moment. And so I'm, I'm just along for the ride, to be honest. It's amazing. So I was lucky enough to see uh, this show in London, and then I saw it again here. And when I saw it in oh, London, wow. for me, it was all about the wizardry. Sorry to use that word. It was all about the wizardry. Sure. And here, it was the emotions that really hit me. Okay. How are audiences responding with which one when they talk to you about it? I think, well, pe I mean, people do have this sort of visceral reaction to it and I know that it start I mean maybe it, maybe it takes people slightly by surprise the, the the kind of impact that it does have I think from the outside looking in there's there's a lot of reasons to think that it might just be like a lot of fun a big thing about wizards but um but that's sort of as far as it goes um and they wouldn't necessarily suspect that Jack Thorne's written a, a proper penetrating play that closes the loop on this far-reaching and and easily accessible myth that hundreds of millions of people around the world have been able to project their lives and their struggles onto. So, I mean, that continues. And when you take it into this new territory of not knowing how to be a parent, not knowing how to admit that you're frightened and you don't know what you're doing, not being able to admit that you're making a lot of mistakes and possibly causing damage without meaning to, even though your intentions are all in the right place. And you've got a next generation of children coming up and fighting that and trying to grow up on their own terms. You know, it's opened up some pretty tough conversations for families and done, uh, hopefully started a bit of healing as well. Was there something that switched over for you that went from being, this is just, you know, popular fantasy fiction to this is really deep? I think, I don't think you suspect, I, I didn't suspect in the first book where you end up by the end of the seventh book. Mm -hmm. But I'm still making discoveries now. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll hear a couple of words together or an echo of a line that's in the play. You're a I'm, scholar when it comes I'm to I'm really not. It <laughs> seems like I'm it. No, I, well, I'm really not. But I mean, it, it's, it's, it's Jack who's the scholar. Mm. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I just, as I say, I'm running to catch up. And I, I, I'm still noticing these things now. And it, it just helps. All of it helps, you know, it's a long run, there's a lot of performances, and so every, every time you make these connections, suddenly it just makes you think about a certain, a certain exchange or a certain sequence or just some particular aspect of the storytelling that makes you, gives you something new, something fresh to think about, and uh, it, it takes up room in your concentration and it doesn't leave anything, room for anything else. Tell yeah. me about meeting J.K. Rowling. She's great. <laughs> She's in, been incredibly generous and just open and, and um, collaborative and trusting on this job. And I think about how uh, industrially tightly controlled the whole thing could have been and how willing she's been to say, look, I'm not a theatre practitioner. I know that I love this medium and I know that I want the story to be told through this form, but I'm not a director, I'm not a theatre actor, I'm not, you know. She handed um, over. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's, um, so she, she's worked on it with and that's, that's the hallmark of the whole thing. Your British colleagues in Harry Potter are mostly making their Broadway debuts, yeah. and you're coming back from doing History Boys. Yeah. How does that experience compare to this one? It's great. I mean, it, it, they were both acclaimed shows, you know, transferring over. Yeah, and again, we're part of a gang. It's not, um, I like that. I wouldn't want to be sort of here where it's just all about me doing the me thing over here, because that's a pretty lonely place to be. Um, this, this town is amazing. Um, uh, sort of, but it's, it's, it's great to be doing it as part of a picture that's bigger than you. Um, because it means you go, you go along to, you know, the Tonys or, or, or these big events and stuff, and, and you're, you're, you're part of, you're not thinking about yourself too much, you know, you're, you're, you're wrapped up in something bigger, and it's just, it becomes fun and it becomes collective, and, uh, and that, that's joyful. That's what theatre should be, I think. In what ways are you like Harry Potter? Well, I, I, went, I went to boarding school in Scotland when I was j just turned 12. Um, and I did, believe it or not, wear little round glasses. <laughs> and did. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I hung around in all the, all the same cafes where Joe was writing the books at the time um, in Edinburgh. And, um, you know, it was, it was a world of wood panelling on the walls and... Um, and, and dorms and houses and you know, entitlement and um, you know, all, all sorts of things to, to deal with. There's a lot that's familiar. And not for nothing do you get these sequences in the play where Harry sets foot on Hogwarts ground again. Mm -hmm. And it's surely that's always gonna be pretty potent for him. You know, this was his home. This was the only place he ever felt at home. Now he's you know, career guy and he's doing his career thing and he's based at the ministry and that's all great and good and well. But 
that question of whether he ever got past 11 or 17 at the least suddenly really comes home to roost when he's you know with his own son but standing in the place where he was that age and coming into being, you know, in his own right. So I'm not a psychologist, and neither are you, but do you think he has PS PTSD? I think I would have sympathy with anybody who did make such a diagnosis, and for my limited understanding of it. The miracle for me, actually, is that, I mean, some people have said that he's out, some of his behavior is out of character. Yeah. They generally speak, speak, speaking, those are people who are talking from having read it without having seen it. Um, and I think, the miracle for me, actually, given his upbringing, given the negligence and abuse and loss that he suffered <laughs> over his most formative years, is not that his behavior is as disordered as it is, but actually that it's not any worse. I mean, that's why it's a juicy play for me. That's why I would bother to spend this much time and creative energy investing in something like this. If I just thought it was some fairy tale about wizards, then who would care? But it's not. It's a, it's a far-reaching, vital and archetypal myth. Okay, well, we have to go, but I have to ask you a very serious question before we yeah. do. I know that you're part of the Fizzing Wisbies. Yes! Go Wisbies. That's the Broadway, yeah. Yeah. Broadway Softball League. Yeah. Do you think that you know the rules better for softball or Quidditch? <laughs> uh, neither. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not... I, I, They're both I'm, a mystery. I'm not a sports guy. I can, you know, I can more or less throw and catch and hit, sort of. Um, probably softball. <laughs> I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know, I would have start with Quidditch. He's, I mean, that's where we, we really do part company. I can't fly. <laughs> oh, right, I forgot about that. <laughs> well, thanks for coming in, Jamie. It's great to see you. Thank you. When we come back, a sneak peek at the upcoming Kennedy Center production of How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. Travesties is the most celebrated comedy of the season. The New York Times calls it a ridiculously entertaining joyride with four Tony nominations, including Best Play Revival. It's possibly the only perfect production on Broadway. Travesties through June 17th only. Hi, I'm Gray Henson. Hi, I'm Barrett Wilbert Weed. And, and you're, you're watching, watching the, the Broadway.com Broadway. show. <sighs> <laughs> Thank you for watching the Broadway.com show. We leave you with Skylar Aston and the cast of the Kennedy Center production of How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, performing What Else? How to Succeed. See you next week. This book is all that I